Now, you might not believe it, and unless you're in Sarasota, you certainly haven't been able to watch it, but the Orioles have started playing baseball games again. Their first three spring training games happened over the last three days, and I'm going to break them down. Some players like Taryn Vavra, Heston Kerstad, and others that stood out. That's coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap some of the action from the weekend and from Monday down in Sarasota and in Florida in general, because the Orioles finally started playing spring training games. They had games on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, winning two of their first three. But of course, in spring training, that's not really what matters. It's more about individual performances and getting guys ready for opening day. But I'm going to talk about some players who stood out, both for good reasons and some for bad reasons over the weekend. About Taron Vavra and Heston Kerstad lighting it up, Lewin Diaz making roster decisions a little bit harder, and some pitchers who stood out like Drew Rahm and Cade Povich. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. But first, just want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And remember to check us out on the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. You can like, comment, and subscribe to Locked on Orioles on YouTube. And I want to thank everyone who has subscribed so far, because as I mentioned on yesterday's episode, when I did a mailbag here on the pod, I've surpassed 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. And as I promised, when we got to 2,000 subscribers on the Locked On Orioles YouTube page, we would do a giveaway. So first of all, to be included in this giveaway, you have to be subscribed to Locked On Orioles on YouTube. So whether you're watching now on YouTube or you're listening via audio platform, make sure to go subscribe on YouTube. That is step one. Step two to be involved in the giveaway, you have to go to the YouTube comments. Now, you can comment on this video or any video this week. That is the week of February 27th through March 3rd. On any YouTube video from the Locked On Orioles page this week, leave a comment telling me your favorite thing about spring training. It could be something you saw in Sarasota. If you've been there, if you haven't been to spring training, that's okay. I haven't. Just the thing that makes you happiest about spring training, whether it's, you know, the Orioles finally be back to, to putting those uniforms on and playing baseball or pitchers and catchers reporting or, you know, roster battles or just the great weather or, you know, random minor league guys getting in the games, whatever it may be, your favorite thing about spring training or your favorite Orioles spring training memory, drop that in the comment section on this video or any video this week and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles podcast on YouTube and you will be entered to win the giveaway. Now you may be wondering, what is the giveaway? Well, I've got everyone's favorite giveaway here. The Orioles Hawaiian shirt. Now I believe this one, Correct me if I'm wrong, is the Circa 2021 Hawaiian shirt? If it's not, this is 2019. It's one of those two years. But the Orioles Hawaiian shirt, there it is for you. That is the giveaway. So again, step one, subscribe to Locked on Orioles on YouTube. Step two, leave a comment in the YouTube comment section on this video about what is your favorite Orioles spring training memory, whether it's being in Baltimore, being anywhere, being in Sarasota, and you will be entered to win the Orioles Hawaiian shirt. Now, you have to comment by the end of the day Friday. On Saturday, I will draw a winner. And on Monday's episode next week, I will announce the winner of the Orioles Hawaiian shirt. So again, that is a thank you to you all for subscribing to Locked on Orioles on YouTube. And don't worry, there'll be plenty more giveaways to get to throughout the season. But let's get to spring training 2023 because the Orioles have played three games already. And again, they've won two. That really doesn't matter that much. It's been nice that the games have been shorter because of the pitch clock rules, even with some very high scoring games that the Orioles have played so far. But wanted to highlight some players and some performances who have stood out over the first couple of games. And let's start with the two bats who just really came out firing. On Saturday, in spring training game number one, Aaron Vavra and Heston Kerstad 
each put on a show. We start with Favre, who started with a two for three with a home run, a double, and two RBIs on Saturday, and then followed it up on Sunday with another two for three with a couple of hard hit balls and two RBIs as well. Got the day off Monday, but had an amazing weekend. And starting with Vavra, this is important for him because in both of my opening day roster projections I've done on this podcast so far, I have projected Taron Vavra to make the opening day roster. And I think unless he gets injured, I'm going to continue to project Favre to make the opening day roster. But again, if he had a really bad spring, he was going to move from probably on the roster to maybe closer to the bubble. I mean, we know there's some big infield prospects vying for a job and some guys could have pushed Taron Vavra out of that spot. But what does he do? He has a four for six weekend. He hits a home run. He drives in four runs. He's hitting the ball hard. And not only that, he's playing some great defense at not his usual position. Vavra, who was a shortstop in college, has generally been known as a second baseman throughout the minor leagues, but has also played a little bit of outfield. We know he was working out at first base this offseason to give himself some versatility with the Orioles wanting some sort of backup first baseman on the roster. But then all of a sudden, a position he's barely played in the minors, he starts the game at third this weekend and makes two amazing defensive plays at third base. So the one question mark for Vavra, who's been known for his plate discipline, his ability to hit to all fields, his ability to not strike out too much, his ability to play around the diamond and play the infield and the outfield. But there's been some issues about how well he can play those defensive positions. One of the big reasons why Vavra didn't play a lot down the stretch last year when the Orioles called him up is there were some questions about his defense at second base, and he did play a little left field defensively as well. And honestly, at times looked better in left field than he did at second, but there were questions about second base. Well, I know the Orioles have Gunnar Henderson and Ramon Arias, who can certainly play third, but if he can play third as well and play it well, that tells me that he should be able to get better defensively at second, which is probably more of a need for the Orioles at this point. And he becomes even more of that super utility guy on this team. And I know it's only been two games and there's more to come. And I still think either way, he's going to make this team and and we'll see how many at-bats he can get, especially because they brought in just an older version of him, it seems like, in Adam Frazier this offseason. But the more versatility, the better. The more the bat looks good, the better. And here's something I put out on Twitter on the Locked On Orioles account on Monday. A guy who plays a lot of positions, you know, seems to be well-liked in the clubhouse. A left-handed bat, can hit a little bit at times. Could Terran Favre just become a better version of Ryan Flaherty? And we know Orioles fans, including myself, love Ryan Flaherty. Favre could be just a better version of that. And that is a valuable player to have on a baseball team. So all good things for Vavra this weekend. And honestly, even better things for Heston Kerstad this weekend. As we know, all the health issues he's gone through, myocarditis after the Orioles took him in the first round in 2020, didn't get to play in any of 2021. Then last year, he comes to minor league spring training, has a severe hamstring injury, misses three months. His first true spring training game was on Saturday. It was in big league spring training, He never even played in really minor league spring training games, but he comes into a big league spring training game on Saturday, first ever. And what does he do? He goes three for three with two opposite field solo home runs. I mean, it does not get better than that for your career spring training debut. And this is why, despite the injuries and the health issues, a lot of people still have him ranked as a top 10 Orioles prospect, and some outlets even have him as a top 100 prospect in baseball right now. Kirst had a power-hitting left-handed hitter who could play the outfield. That swing looks even better than it did at Arkansas, and it looked really good there when the Orioles drafted him second overall. I mean, you can't get any better than the opposite field home runs. And then, you know, he comes in as a pinch hitter Sunday and goes one for one, did get the day off on Monday, but he's four for four to start his spring training career. Just a great sign with his health. And listen, there's nothing Heston Kerstad can do to start the year in the big leagues this year. I mean, he's never played a game above high A. He's basically locked in to starting the 2023 season in double A buoy. But what he can do in big league spring training is hang around long enough to make the Orioles think, you know what? Maybe if he's hitting buoy well for a month or two, he could get a quick promotion to AAA Norfolk. And then if he's hitting Norfolk well, maybe he is an option for the big leagues at the end of this year. And I don't think that's plausible, but he's really setting himself up to be potentially an opening day roster guy in 2024. That's what Heston Kerstad really should be shooting for right now. And this performance over the weekend, I mean, 
just got to feel so happy for the guy. And it's, it's only going to help him moving forward. But Kerstad and Vavra, they weren't the only two guys who showed out this weekend. And although Vavra, you know, worked on first base this offseason is trying to be that backup first base option, there's a bunch of other exterior options that the Orioles brought in, whether on waivers or on minor league deals this offseason, who are trying to vie for that, quote, backup first base role, if it even exists on the Orioles roster. It may not. But if it does, a couple of guys made their first attempt at winning that job this weekend. We'll talk about who that was and how they did coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Built Bar. Are you looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and the calories? Then you got to try a Built Bar because it's actually tasty and it's actually healthy. It's both things. You're not going to find another protein bar that is healthy and actually tasty. First of all, what makes them tasty? Well, all the bars covered in 100% real chocolate, amazing flavors like peanut butter brownie, which is my personal favorite. But here's the thing, they still have the great health benefits of a protein bar. Only 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein in every bar, and every bar still tastes like a candy bar. I just don't know how they do it. But it gets better. You used to have to go to built.com, order your built bars, get them in the mail. You can still do that. That's a fine process. But now, you can walk into your local Walmart or walk into your local Sam's Club and pick up a box of built bars and walk right out the door. Now there's even a quicker way to get your hands on those delicious and nutritious built bars. So as we take a look back at the weekend that was in Orioles spring training, starting off the spring training games in Sarasota, Vavra and Kerstad were good, but some other hitters really showed out because the Orioles did score 10 runs in each of their first two spring training games. They lost 14 to two on Monday, but 10 runs in the first two wins is not too bad. And some guys were able to put on some performances, specifically all these guys that have been thrown into this mix for the quote backup first baseman. It's been a trend that's been talked about this off season and early in spring trading. Are the Orioles looking for a left-handed hitting backup to Ryan Mountcastle? And I think they are to an extent because they've brought all these guys in. But I also think as I've talked about on my roster previews, is that Taron Vavra is going to win that quote-unquote job. More so, he's going to be the utility guy off the bench who can play first base. You also have Adley Rutschman and James McCann who can do it. And I think they're teaching Anthony Santander to play the position as well. So at this point, I don't think any of these guys I'm going to talk about are going to make the opening day roster. But if they really continue to hit, one of them could change that equation. And the first guy trying to do it this weekend was Lewin Diaz, who of course was DFA'd and claimed by the Orioles twice this offseason. I think it felt like he was on 14 different teams in a span of two months, but ended up with the Orioles in the minors. And on Sunday, he goes two for three with a double, with a home run, with four RBIs. He has three hard hit balls. His homer was mashed at 110.2 miles per hour down the line. The double was scorched at 106.8 miles per hour off the bat. Then he went one for two with a single and a walk in Monday's game against the Rays. And so far he's showing out, listen, Diaz is an elite defensive first baseman and a left-handed hitter with a pretty swing, but he hasn't made a whole lot of contact in his big league career. That's why it didn't really work out with the Marlins. And that's why they DFA'd him this offseason, even though they need offensive options. Could he make the team? Yes. Do I think he's going to? No. But if he keeps hitting like this, he could certainly push his way onto the roster. And that's the big thing for some of these other guys, like Curtis Terry. Yes, he's a right-handed hitter, but he plays first base. He had a three-run homer on Saturday, crushed a ball. Ryan O'Hearn, who came over from the Royals, went two for four in the two games he played. Franchi Cordero had a hit and three hard-hit balls this weekend. Josh Lester, who they signed to a minor league deal, had a hit as well. Both of those guys, left-handed hitters who can play first. So I say all this to, to make the point that I, again, do not think any of these guys are going to make the Orioles roster as that backup first base option. But if Lewin Diaz keeps hitting like this, or if Ryan O'Hearn just hits in every single spring training game, I mean, these are guys with major league experience. If Cordero can keep the strikeouts kind of down and keep hitting the ball hard, again, all guys with big league experience in their career, it's not out of the question for them to make the roster. And especially if there's an injury to one of the 13 guys currently projected to the roster, or if a guy like Ryan McKenna really struggles or Kyle Stowers really, really struggles or Taron Vavra kind of flips the other way and really, really struggles. Don't be surprised 
And specifically if there's an injury, because even if there's an injury to an infielder, people would say, oh, Joey Ortiz, Jordan Westberg. I don't know if the O's would do that. I think if there was an injury to an infielder, I think they look at this group of the minor league signings and say, who's hitting the best? And if it is Lewin Diaz, I think the O's would give him a shot on the opening day roster. So if he's going to hit like this and a little luck comes his way injury-wise to another player, it's not out of the question that he goes north to Boston with the Orioles or or, uh, Ryan O'Hearn does it or Franchi Cordero does it. It's not out of the question at all. It's not likely, but again, if they hit and there's an injury, they're right there because I feel like there's, there's 13 hitters who are pretty secure on the roster at this point. And then there's a drop off and then there's these guys and the prospects. I feel like, the next man up would be a guy like Lewin Diaz or maybe a Nomar Mazzara or a Franchi Cordero. So they are somewhat close to that big league roster if they keep hitting. But it wasn't just pitchers or just hitters, I should say, that showed out this weekend. Despite the Orioles giving up 25 runs in three games, including 14 on Monday, there were some pitchers who had some good performances that I'm going to highlight coming up next. Guys like Drew Rahm, Cade Povich, and others, but also there were a good amount of bad performances, but specifically a couple that could impact what the Orioles' bullpen looks like heading into opening day. So after touching on some of the hitters who really performed well in the Orioles' first three spring training games, wanted to touch on the pitchers real fast because, again, they gave up 25 runs in three games. You're not going to get a lot of good pitching performances. It is spring training, so you don't know how much to take from these guys. For all of them, it's their first appearance of the spring, so you don't want to put too much stock into it. But there's a couple guys I wanted to mention. First being Drew Rahm. He gets the start in the Orioles' first spring training game on Saturday. Two innings, two hits, a run, two Ks, and a walk. Listen... Out of the 12 starting pitchers that the Orioles have said are in the mix for the rotation, I would say Rom has the worst chance or the 12th best chance of making the opening day rotation. It's just not going to happen. He's going to start the year in the Norfolk rotation. But it's nice to see him have a a nice little outing to start the year. Yenair Cano was impressive. I think a guy who's definitely on the outside looking in of the roster bubble and getting into the bullpen. But he did have a little major league time last year after coming over from the Twins in the Jorge Lopez deal. And Listen, he threw a one, two, three inning with two strikeouts. Big thing was no walks. The changeup was ridiculous. His sinker was 96 to 98. He's got really good stuff from a funky arm angle. I think he's going to be a good reliever if the O's can really figure him out. Speaking of the Jorge Lopez trade, Kate Povich pitched well this weekend. He went on Sunday in relief. Two innings, no runs, one hit, three Ks, and no walks. Now, he wasn't really facing many of the big leaguers anymore. He pitched late in the game, so it was more minor league guys. He did throw 30 pitches and got four whiffs, but his fastball was 93-94. He was throwing all of his secondary pitches. And listen, two scoreless innings in big league spring training is two scoreless innings. That is a pretty big boost for the Orioles. And then a couple guys who could fare into opening day suggestions. A great start for Andrew Politti, the Orioles' Rule 5 pick, the right-handed reliever out of Boston. Threw a scoreless inning on Monday in his spring training Orioles debut The more scoreless innings he gets, the better chance he has to make this opening day roster and stick with his organization. And then how about Noah DeNoyer on Monday in his first appearance of spring training gets added to the 40 man this offseason after being an undrafted free agent in 2019. Shout out to Noah DeNoyer, two scoreless innings out of the Oriole bullpen on Monday against the Rays. Shout out to Noah DeNoyer. But I did want to finish up with a couple of guys who had Really bad first appearances in the game against the Rays on Monday. And again, I don't want to put too much stock into spring training, especially when it's your first appearance in a spring training game in Sarasota. It's February. I'm not getting worked up. But the reason I'm going to mention these two guys, that's Joey Crable and Darwin's at Hernandez, is that one is on the 40 man in Crable. The other was at one point, but is not anymore in Hernandez. These two guys have a very short leash when it comes to trying to make the opening day roster. They both have a chance. Don't get me wrong. They both certainly have a chance. I mean, especially Crable, who spent almost the entire season in the Orioles bullpen last year. He definitely has a chance to make the opening day roster. And Hernandez has spent a good amount of time in the big leagues with the Red Sox. Although he doesn't have good command, he's got serious stuff from the left side. So he's got a chance, especially if D.L. Hall is going to be in AAA and Nick Vespi is not going to be ready for opening day. And there's questions about Keegan Aiken. Hernandez has a chance here. 
But Joey Crable gives up three runs on three hits with two home runs over an inning. No strikeouts, no walks on Monday. And Darwinson Hernandez pitches arguably worse. A third of an inning, two hits, four runs, no strikeouts, and three walks. That is not good for your Orioles spring training debut for the lefty. And he's also leaving to go pitch in the World Baseball Classic. So he's even going to have less time with Orioles coaches getting a look at him here in camp. So that was really not a good start for Hernandez. But the reason I want to mention these two guys is that, again, especially with Dylan Tate out, with potential questions about the readiness for Felix Bautista and D.L. Hall and Nick Vespi and potentially other relievers, there could be injuries. Joey Crable's the guy where, yeah, he didn't have a great finish to his year last year, but he could be like the security blanket where you're looking through all these guys and maybe Bautista and Tate miss opening day. You're just looking through all these guys. You're like, we need to add another righty. And we're not sure about Politi and we're not sure about Mike Bauman and we're not sure about Yenny Cano. You just go with, you know what? Let's go with the guy we know we're going to get. And that's Joey Crable because he was in your bullpen basically all of 2022. So Crable has a chance to at least fall backwards into maybe the final bullpen spot on opening day. But This first outing allowing two homers, which the home run ball was his kryptonite, especially when he struggled in the second half last year. I know it's his first appearance, but you can't do that because he now has more of an opening with Tate injured and Bautista potentially not ready to get back into his spot in the Orioles bullpen and have a chance for the first month of the year to pitch well enough to stay in that bullpen when Dylan Tate returns from injury. But if he's going to pitch poorly in spring training, it's not locked in that he's going to steal that spot. If you know, he gets outpitched by Andrew Politi and Yenny Cano and Mike Bauman and other right-handers. The Orioles are going to have no problem sending Crable to AAA and putting those guys in that replacement for Dylan Tate's spot. They're going to have no issue at all. So Crable's going to have to win this job. And that's not a good start. And same for Hernandez. He had a chance, but not a good start. So, you know, I don't want to overreact to any of these numbers this weekend, but It's nice to get a good first feeler for how they're doing and how it's going to play into some of the positional or even open day roster battles coming up throughout spring training for the Orioles. But we're now just about a month from opening day. It's going to be fun. Now, the one thing you all may have noticed this weekend is that Masson did not air any of the first three Orioles spring training games. In fact, they didn't even have a radio broadcast for Monday's game against the Rays. It was just out in the ether. Who could have known if the game even happened or not? Now, Masson's only broadcasting four games this spring training, which we've talked about, is an upgrade from three. Congratulations to the world's largest toddler, John Angelos. You, quote, did better from three to four. But it's ridiculous that you're only broadcasting four games. Now, if you have MLB TV or (laughs) other means, there are 12 total Orioles spring training games this year that are being broadcast. And the first one of those is today. February 28th, a one o'clock start between the Orioles and the Pirates. AT&T Sportsnet Pittsburgh, the Pirates broadcast crew, will be broadcasting that game on MLB TV. So it will be broadcast, which means I'll get a chance to watch the Orioles in spring training because I'm not in Sarasota and I won't be going down, but I'll get a chance to watch them for the first time this spring. So because of that, coming up on tomorrow's episode, we'll break down this a little bit closer to what we would do for a regular season game. Kyle Bradish is going to take the hill for the first time. We'll see some other arms. Maybe we'll see some top prospects. And coming up on tomorrow's episode, I'll recap everything we saw from the Orioles' first televised, not on Masson, but televised spring training game of the year. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.